Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, if you watched the first video in this series, if you didn't, you might want to check it out, though I will do a little review up front. Alright, so picking up where we left off in the last video, let's look at Saturn, the tempo setter for evolution, and consider his current sidereal position in the cosmos for how it might be guiding us through the evolutionary level of the game we're playing at right now in these inarguably transformative times. Let's see how Saturn might be helping us better define this mother thread of our lineage, a concept that I introduced in the last video. The mother thread being the primary idea born of and with the current race of man to which we all belong. A through line which emerges from the struggle to reconcile destiny and free will via the rational mind. The rational mind being the thing that sets us apart from the race preceding ours, a race far more in touch with their intuitive nature, never separated from a perfect knowing of their place in the cosmic order until their slow descent. We'll talk about the cyclic nature of time in more detail in another video because it really is crucial to understanding these concepts. The rational mind then being the thing that allows us to choose in or out of harmony with the cosmic order. If the rational mind is the thing that allows us to choose out of harmony with the natural order because we don't see it clearly anymore, we don't have that third eye as readily accessible anyway, then the rational mind is the thing that can block our understanding of our own divinity until we perfect it. Perfect our intellect, that is, our rational mind, our higher intellect. And this may seem counterintuitive that we should focus on the cultivation of the very thing that seems to block us from experiencing unity. The higher intellect is closer to the idea of wisdom, really. It's the thing that allows us to know ourselves, to realize ourselves fully as an individual entity so well that we discover the cosmic order through ourself as a unique expression of it, the cosmic order. We discussed how our thoughts, words, and deeds are inherently creative and so continually feed during our time on earth input into the singular cause, the Godhead function from which our individual destinies or designs are derived. Predestination isn't a thing set in stone, but a living evolving pattern, a, a live feedback loop that we are feeding data into as we do karma on earth karma referring to every move we make. So currently we've got Saturn in Aquarius, barely, house of its own rulership. It's actually retrograding as we speak basically and will find its way back into Capricorn very soon, which is the other sign it rules before returning to Aquarius next spring, I believe. But I want to focus on its position in Aquarius first in this video, and then I'll zoom in on this, the specific star energy that will be fueling Saturn this whole time. A star that actually straddles the cusp of Capricorn and Aquarius. So this information will apply when the retrograde back into Capricorn happens as well. In Aquarius, Saturn is at full strength in the sign of the collective. Now, Saturn is always working for divine justice. It's always geared toward human evolution, which is why Saturn is the ruler of this, the sign of the collective, Aquarius. And the old man is as happy as he'll ever be in his own crib because he's in full power. And because he's in full power, his lessons will be especially potent, yet graceful and merciful if we can see them that way. 
Aquarius is a very dynamic and pretty misunderstood sign, I think. There's really nothing airy fairy about it, except that it's an air sign. And I dare say it's rather anti-hippie. But I'll explain what I mean by that later. Aquarius is the natural 11th house of all those good things in life, like gains, reward, network circles, popularity. But Aquarius is also a densely karmic point in the zodiac, a place where a lot of karmic tests are doled out. Saturn asks us, what do we do with those gains and network circles, that wealth and influence? that were given through the 11th house. Are we functioning for the good of the people when we're given it all? Because doing what's good for the people, the masses, is what Aquarius is all about. But how to do what is good for the people isn't as obvious an answer as one may think. And this is the revelation I believe Saturn is gifting us right now. Pleasing the energy of Saturn in Aquarius requires more than a humanitarian streak and an able mind. It requires the highest level of discernment. We can be kind, well-educated, smart as whips, cultured, well-traveled, open-minded, and also ignorant. And we can be ignorant of our ignorance and self-righteous in our ignorance. Saturn in Aquarius is asking us above all else to be discerning. It's even more important than being nice. Don't be mean. <laughs> but be discerning first and foremost. Discernment is a product of a well-developed rational mind or higher intellect combined with a well-developed intuitive mind plus both of those minds have to be functioning outside of a false framework. A false framework being anything that is not in alignment with the natural order. Aquarius is an advanced sign. It's a hard one. <laughs> It's the second to last in the zodiacal wheel. Um, and the wheel itself is a map that guides us through the stages of human progress, the stages of human consciousness during this grand cycle of man on earth. The highest vibration of Aquarius' energy makes it the point where we have realized our own design as a unique expression of the cosmic order and make all of our choices on earth by it meaning we are living in alignment with the natural order the way each of us is uniquely designed to do, if that makes sense. So it'll look a little bit different for everyone. And in living this way, we are serving the masses in the highest way possible, simply by existing, simply by honoring our own designs. It may sound like chaos to think about everyone doing that, it's because we haven't seen that model yet. Saturn rules systems and structures. So when Saturn is in Aquarius, the sign of the systems that run our world, it's going to buck against any system that is no longer serving the collective. But we've got to meet Saturn halfway. Saturn is asking us to penetrate the illusions that keep us trapped in a system we know is corrupt in order to understand what actually serves the collective good and what only appears to serve it. And Saturn's asking us to do this through the process of knowing ourselves. Saturn's goal is to restore a worldwide structure in alignment with the natural order, which was once in place long, long ago. However, at this point in evolution, that homogenous structuralization, which is part of our mother thread, that homogenous structuralization around a divine pattern will look different. It's supposed to look different now. Now that structure must res uh, reflect 
the diversity that is inevitable when we're each fully realizing our own designs, which is only possible through the use of the rational mind. And it is certainly not what we call socialism built around the current centralized power structure. The thing is, we don't need to worry about masterminding this new system, nor do we have to risk life and limb to try and dismantle the rotten one. We need only to focus on knowing ourselves better and evolve accordingly, to live accordingly. And that and everything else will take care of itself. Aquarius is a sign where we can easily be led astray by the villains of this game. Who are they? They're anything that distracts us from knowing ourselves better and integrating what we learn. Less evolved Aquarius energy can be hijacked to exploit an individual's care for this world, rerouting their humanitarian and environmental ideals, for instance, onto a path imitating virtue. If you really delve into history, you'll see that this has been an issue since the dawn of the rational mind. Hijacked minds. Good people trying to do good, but following the wrong lead. It's the biggest thing standing in our way now, in my humble opinion. Aquarius is particularly prone to illusion because it's co-ruled by Rahu, the north node of the moon who can be both susceptible to manipulation or manipulative. Rahu's lower nature can be understood in its, um, in its correspondence to the caudate nucleus head in the basal ganglia, which among other faculties controls habits, focusing our attention, uh, focusing our eyes, reward function the head of the dragon. And the caudate nucleus itself looks like a fish or dragon. In, Ve in Vedic myth, Rahu is the head of a dragon. An ancestral energy. Which is probably why the caudate nucleus also looks like a sperm. Rahu takes us toward our purpose in life our destiny, what our ancestors programmed for us. Anyway, Rahu's dragon energy has got to be tamed while Saturn is in Aquarius, or Saturn is the ultimate tamer of Rahu's energy. This taming includes disciplined powers of discernment. Because if properly mesmerized and incentivized, Rahu's energy can easily be misdirected. One of the primary incentives that often succeeds in misdirecting Rahu is popularity. More to the point, the assurance of belonging, the comfort of knowing we won't be social outcasts. Being outcast is a fear that cannot be underestimated in humans, and it gets us in a lot of trouble especially here in Aquarius. We've been taught that if you blow the whistle on the real shit in this world, you get exiled or worse. And so it keeps the majority of humans staying in the safe zone, pointing fingers at anyone who would question the official narratives, crying witch, or in this era, conspiracy theorist. Are there ridiculous conspiracy theories out there? Sure are. And those are traps laid to steer the curious but less discerning off course. Laid by who, you say? Laid by us, I say. In the quantum sense, we built all the traps we fall into in this world. Responsibility is power. When we take responsibility for all this, we empower ourselves. We designed these traps so that we could evolve through the process of getting wise to them. So we don't even have to hate on the worst evil in the world. We thank it for its lessons and move on. The lower polarity we fund and fuel wear different masks throughout the ages, but they are our shadows of ignorance made manifest, and it's 
again, our responsibility to shine a light on them long enough to understand exactly how they function, exactly how we fell into their traps so we won't do it again, and then starve them out by withdrawing our attention, our energy, in every way possible, and redirect it into ourselves. And this will take courage. The lower polarity will show up with a false version of every avenue we're organically taking to evolve. And the devil, take, uh, the devil tells two truths for every lie. So those false avenues feel very much like real ones. It doesn't need to be some grand conspiracy unless you, if you want to think of it that way, think of it as a grand conspiracy we conspired for ourselves to find our way out of. Luckily, while Saturn is ruling his own roost during this time, it will be made very clear to us in one way or another where our discernment has lapsed by making us feel powerless to affect change if we're still buying into the level of this illusory reality that keeps us enslaved. If we feel fearful or powerless when we watch the news, be sure that we're still locked into a limiting belief system. And if we find ourselves there, we've got to first have compassion for ourselves, which means losing the guilt complex, because the guilt complex is the enemy of all enemies. It makes us very easy to manipulate and brainwash. Guilt and pity are extremely low vibratory states of consciousness. And the main arm of the media, which is the publicity unit for the lower polarity, is built to exploit our grievances so that we will pour our guilty, pitiful, fearful vibes back into the machine, keeping it alive. Mercifully, any entity that might try and misdirect us on Saturn's watch will have much more difficulty than usual pulling the wool over our eyes. So a lot of revelation can come out of this time. And revelation involves disillusionment. So it can be painful for the ego. And it's important that we don't put up resistance to that pain because what's on the other side will be so liberating. The hippie movement is a great example of Aquarian energy misdirected. Here we see an organic upsurge in consciousness gaining new footing in opposition to the ultimately oppressive ideas of reality fed to us in the 1950s. The soul suckery that came from that picket fence, TV dinner, Honey, I'm home era had us fleeing to the realms of existence unexplored just to catch our breath. And this natural imperative to break out our consciousness was quickly infiltrated and steered toward chaotic indulgence in order to push it onto a false course. Now guess where Saturn was during the rise of the hippie movement? Right where it is now. Knowing this, we should really consider how our virtuous attentions toward the collective good today might be being hijacked and steered in the wrong ass direction, having us convinced we're headed in the right one, having us convinced we're doing good for humanity. So what is the path to better discernment being required of us by Saturn? And how does it contribute to the object of the game at this level? Here's where a consideration of the particular moon mansion where Saturn sits helps guide us tremendously. Uh, each moon mansion, called a nakshatra in Sanskrit, is fueled by a different asterism, star or star system. There are 27 total uh, uh, asterisms um, fueling us in this age of man. You can also think of them as the star systems that we're representing energetically um, to animate our avatars. Saturn's current position in Dhanishta Nakshatra, fueled by the asterism Delphinus, is a dolphin energy, 
sometimes a python, which brings to mind Pythia, the oracle of Delphi, Delphi, Delphinus, all related to the star's energy. There's a lot to open up there that I'd love to go into in another video. Danishta's Shakti, the energetic gift it gives, is to empower the individual toward the establishment of the collective. And this, I think, is the level of the game we're playing at. This is the object. Danishta's Shakti is telling us that the way we can best serve the collective is through the realization of the self. It's through the process of fully realizing our own design that we can achieve the level of discernment necessary to know what is in the collective's highest good versus not. Danishta is about rhythm, symbolized by drums and flute, speaking to the evolutionary stage of consciousness associated with this mansion and the mansion preceding it, Shravana, symbolized by the listening ear. Listen to the rhythm. Saturn was sitting in Shravana during its grand conjunction with Jupiter in 2020 and 2022, which tells us a lot about the times we're in as well, and I might tackle that in another video too. So the highest aim of this pair of stars, Shravana and Danishta, is to get us in touch with our own rhythms, and therefore the rhythms of the natural order. Most of our programs serve the off-kilter rhythms of society because most of our parents raised us that way so that we wouldn't be outcasts. Identity politics is one of those false paths, false avenues that are imitating our evolutionary trajectory. In this case, it's imitating the path of individuation. Our egos, an aspect of our rational mind, are built to uphold our early programming, as much of a, many of us know, and, and so it takes a lot of effort to convince them to even hear a perspective that doesn't fit the worldview of their program, let alone override that pattern. This is why it's so often through traumatic experience that people transform their worldview. It takes a bomb dropping in our lap to jar our ego out of its role as gatekeeper of the old program long enough to let the light in. And back to that basal ganglia and the caudate nucleus head, which corresponds to North Node Rahu's energy. Depending on the conditions of the North Node in your birth chart, you will be more or less able to reprogram yourself. We're all capable, but it'll be more or less difficult, I should say. If your North Node is strong, you'll find it easy to shift paradigms. And this has its downside if you're not being discerning, of course. If your north node is in an uncomfortable position in the zodiac, it will resist input that might lead it to a new worldview. So it's important to get right with your Rahu in general, but especially while Saturn is in Aquarius. So Danisha is the more active in this rhythmic pair of stars, asking us not only to hear our rhythm, but to dance that rhythm into the world so that others can benefit from it too. Danishta is also associated for da uh, with dance for this reason. Danishta is a Mars-ruled moon mansion. All the moon mansions are ruled by a different planet. Uh, Danishta is the exaltation point of Mars energy, the highest vibratory um, stage of the development of Mars's energy in the zodiac. And this is within a Saturn-ruled sign. So the nature of this asterism is a revolutionary, geared toward divine justice and structure, a structure built on divine justice. Mars is the soldier, right? Making Danishta the ultimate honorable warrior. It's the place where dance becomes a martial art. It's battle formation. At um, the time when war was first introduced as part of the human experience, when we were still more aligned with the cosmic order, battle formations actually harnessed cosmic energy and war was fought with an understanding of karmic justice. Dance, movement, rhythm as technology used strategically. 
the Latin name Delphinus, the dolphin, who sings and dances its rhythms into our waters, infusing them with the wisdom of its experience, delighting hearts everywhere. But it ain't easy as a human to channel this energy. It's not easy to live by our own deeper rhythms. It's a radical move, more radical than I think people realize. Because a lot of people have themselves convinced that they're already marching by the beat of their own drum. You can have a very expressive, unique identity and be successful in life without ever hearing the deeper rhythms that will lead you to the higher perspective that will unlock greater creative agency in this realm. A life lived in alignment with our truest nature is a life where every move we make is a channeled work of art that brings the collective into greater harmony and fulfills us. Ironically, to live with this level of agency will likely make us feel at odds with the collective at times. We'll be serving the collective from outside of the current collective programming but when you're living in this way, your thoughts, words, and deeds will not but. When you're living in this way, your thoughts, words, and deeds will have greater influence on the collective consciousness than one who makes moves out of flow. It's the merciful design of the universe that harmonious actions hold more weight. But again, what is harmonious with the natural order may not feel harmonious to you right away. Because we've been so out of touch for so long. It's not all butterflies and rainbows and feel good. It's a battle. It's a battle you want to fight because you feel what it's doing to you living this way. So Danishta Shakti to empower the individual toward the establishment of the collective. Individuate to unify. At its highest vibration, Danishta dares to be an outlier by honoring its own articulation of the cosmic voice because we know it will serve the collective, even if the collective thinks we are working in opposition to them. Danishta, I think this is interesting, is traditionally said to be the one asterism that denies physical marriage. Um, I say physical because there is an internal marriage, which is the true marriage, the marriage of the masculine and feminine within the self, the autonomous being who can then regenerate itself. And that's the goal of all goals. So Danishta epitomizes autonomy, married to their duty, or dharma. Autonomy is a huge theme of this next era, and we'll look more into that um, in the next video, in the next transit, that I'll be dissecting. Danisha has a lot of allure about it, which is interesting because of this denial of marriage thing, because Danishas are often, or many of the world's sex, most well-known sex symbols are Danishas. They have an allure. They are the, the most heard of, the desirable object, the star of wealth and fame. And Danisha gives this allure because it has the potential to know what to do with it. They make the sexiest star the one that's the least interested <laughs> in getting involved. One-on-one, <laughs> -on -one anyway. They have the, the big picture in mind. But a less evolved Danishta energy can be easily possessed by anything that might wish to reroute its dutiful nature. And so it does need to cultivate those powers of discernment available to it. 
while Saturn is in Dineshta, it's asking us to really boldly listen to our little voice, those deeper rhythms, and start amplifying them over time until they help us see our world with new eyes, hear it with new ears. And we can't expect that voice to feel familiar at first. In fact, it will likely push us out of our comfort zone to heed it at all. That voice may be opposing our long-held belief systems, ones we've identified with, fought for, ones we've taken for granted, ones we've taken irreversible action toward. It might trigger people who love us when we're stepping into and living out our own signature. If you already consider yourself an uber individual, the game isn't over. In fact, much of individualism is false individuation. We have to ask ourselves hard questions. What aspects of our identity, e even those we are proud of and embrace and had to fight for, are built on trauma, resistance, fear, expectations, given circumstance, politics. So again, a lot of compassion for the self is necessary during this process of disillusionment that comes from fully honoring the path of self-initiation. Once we've cleared resistance to our deeper rhythms, we'll know it, I think, by the tingles of conviction that would have us willing to risk being exiled in order to dance that rhythm into the world. We'll know it also by a lack of urgency to label ourselves or wear that rhythm out on our sleeve, put it in our bio, which would be more of a show for the ego. Instead, we'll find ourselves relishing the quiet steps we take when no one's watching, those moments when we use our rational and intuitive mind in perfect marriage to choose free of social constraints in harmony with our deepest rhythms, which are in harmony with the cosmic order. Pretty soon that which would cast us out will be crushed under the weight of our personal conviction. And the universe steps in and helps you out. It conspires in your favor. As soon as you start down this path, it will meet you halfway. In this case, Saturn will meet you halfway but our faith in ourselves will be tested because the lower pole don't go without a fight. We fight back with magic, the magic we wield when we live like we know that every thought, word, and deed is a creative vote toward the establishment of the collective in alignment with the natural order or against it. And we shouldn't assume we know which is which at this point. It's a process, and the planetary energies are su such that we have never been more supported in this process. And luckily, mere awareness of our objective is a huge step in the right direction. All right. Let's move on to the next transit to go deeper and then tie this thesis up in a bow. Um, well, not really. <laughs> really just throw it all out there with a look into the future of our kind. So thank you so much for making it this far. Um, I don't really like listening to myself talk this much, to be honest. Thank you so much for making it this far, if you did. Um, I know it's a lot of intense talk, but I really needed to get it out of me. And I do so with a humble sense of duty as I do my best to walk the the path I've been describing. If you're interested in knowing how current transits are helping guide you specifically through your chart along your unique path of individuation, I'd love to help interpret that for you. I practice sidereal astrology and I weave in many invaluable ancient techniques that I think you'll find pretty empowering. My readings are always nothing but empowering. Um, so feel free to shoot me a message at the email in the comments, and I'll give you the information on booking a re recorded reading. All right, till part three. Love you guys.